people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. Up and comer Taylor Robertson inks agreement with Lee Baxter Promotions. Fresh off a dominant stoppage victory over Yasselin Fernandez, Super Flyweight contender Taylor Robertson appears to be ready to take on the world. A Common Games bronze medalist in 2018, Robertson, six wins, one loss with two knockouts, has established herself as one of the best 115 pounders in the world already and is now taking it on globally. Robertson has signed a multi-year, multi-fight agreement with top Canadian promoter Lee Baxter Promotions, which will also see her appear on future events globally on DAZN. We've had our eyes on Taylor since her amateur days from seeing her at the Pan Am Games. It's been obvious from the start that she is not only a brilliant boxer, but there's a star quality about her. Taylor Robertson's fought on Mick Francis shows, Dean Lonergan shows. That's Tasman Fighters, that's Duco Events, well-to-do promotional outfits in the land down under in Australia, and now she appears to be... The last time we saw her, she fought on Lou DeBella's show in Australia. George Kimbosos versus Devin Haney. Now she appears to be going global. This has been a game-changing year in women's boxing. We've seen so many names break through into the mainstream, and we truly feel that Taylor is going to be the next one. She certainly has the ceiling for it. Time, time is on Taylor's side. Yeah, Taylor's only 24 years old. Taylor's next fight against Chaos Manawa. That's going to be a Tasman Promotions show. That's Mick Francis. Looks like she's still got an ongoing relationship with them. In spite of inking this deal with Lee Baxter, a Canadian-based promotion outfit. That's going to go down early next month in November in Australia. Oh. Robertson was an outstanding amateur in her native Australia where she resides in Brisbane. A multi-time national and state champion, she represented Australia at the IEBA World Championships in 2019 as well. As a professional, Robertson's only loss is to world title challenger and top five bantamweight shotgun Shannon O'Connell. A close split decision loss in a bid for the Commonwealth title in just her fourth fight. Since the loss to O'Connell, Robertson has incredibly lost just two rounds. She and her coach and manager, Glenn Azar, have decided to return to more comfortable weight classes, focusing on 115 and perhaps 112 pounds. In addition to her win over Fernandez, who was 11-1 entering the bout, Robertson also dazzled her home audience on the undercard of Devin Haney versus George Kimbosos at Marvel Stadium in Melbourne. That win over Sarah Higginson was broadcast globally Globally on ESPN Plus as one of the featured undercard bouts. Coach and manager Azar said, Our team is excited to team up with Lee Baxter Promotions, especially as Taylor sets to fight an IBF world title eliminator in November. We're ready to push for a world title and be seen on a global stage. We believe Lee Baxter is the promoter who can do that for us. In a country buzzing with women stars, including Shernika Johnson and Ebony Bridges, Taylor is among Australia's most popular fighters. With over 25 thousand followers on Instagram, Robertson is also one of Everlast Australia's few sponsored athletes. We think with the exposure to an even broader audience, Taylor is naturally going to become an even bigger star, said Baxter. But more importantly, we feel like she will be a world champion in 2023. Focusing on super flyweight, as she's shown in the past though, she's a disciplined athlete. She can follow the Amanda Serrano model and win titles anywhere from 112 to 122 and beyond before it's all said and done. Marciela Lujan of Argentina is the super flyweight division's IBF champion. It's gotta be who Taylor Robertson and her team are targeting because she's set to fight in an IBF eliminator. And the super flyweight division, you know, none of those champions that are there, none of them are with a major promotional outfit that has a broadcast deal, a major broadcast deal. So Taylor integrating herself into this weight class will bring it more exposure than it's been getting. There are four champions at super flyweight. WBA champion Clara Lascurat, newly crowned WBC champion Ashley. Ashley Gonzalez Macias, who just pried the WBC title away from long reigning champion Lourdes Juarez. That was at the beginning of this month. 
Argentinian champion Marciela Luhang and the WBO champion of Japan Tamao Ozawa. And in time with training, you could give Taylor Robertson good odds against any one of the four active reigning world champions in today's super flyweight division. The virtue of pairing up with Lee Baxter, a Canadian-based promotional outfit, is the virtue of that is it gets her on a major platform. It gets her on the zone. Lee Baxter, Canadian-based promotional outfit, has aired cards on the DAZN platform before. Beyond the November fight she's got coming up, that IBF eliminator, Taylor Robertson is scheduled to make her North American debut early next year, presumably in Canada as part of a Lee Baxter promotion. So they've got big plans for Taylor. You could argue that she's taking a page out of Ebony Bridges' playbook, going international in order to get more eyes on her fights. That's essentially what Ebony did, relocating from Australia to the United Kingdom. Ebony didn't stay domestic she didn't stay local doesn't appear that Taylor Robertson has any intentions of doing that either It's a smart game plan if I do say so myself men super middleweight news David Benavidez says he's willing to fight the winner of Bivol versus Ramirez yeah, and I'm willing to lick hot gravy off a of Dua Lipa's inner thigh doesn't mean it's gonna happen with the 25 year old's youth being wasted in what he believes are meaningless bouts Benavidez could opt to take his talents to the light heavyweight division in what could be viewed as one of the more intriguing bouts left on the 2022 calendar Dimitri Bivol will attempt to defend his WBA crown against number one contender Gilberto Ramirez on November 5th. Admittedly, Benavidez reveals that he'll be an interested observer come fight night, although he remains non-committal to making the trek to 175 pounds. If he were given the opportunity to face the winner... Oh, so he's not going to move up there and earn the shot. He's expecting someone to give it to him. Just give it to him. Benavidez reveals he would quickly accept. David ain't going to fight none of those people. Boxing is a funny sport. Boxing fans, they're funny people, they got funny logic. Underneath it all, they know better. They know that David's not gonna fight either one of those two guys. He's not. He's still at super middleweight. He can't seem to get the fights that he wants there, but he's still there. Even though the PBC has super middleweights, they got a couple of fights they can make in-house. They're not making them. Don't look like they're about to make them. The guy's still there. He's still there. He's still there. Shit, I'd be 100% down for that, said Benavidez during an interview with Lalo's Boxing. Prior to his interest in facing the winner of Bivol versus Ramirez, Benavidez registered his sixth consecutive knockout victory earlier this year. The former two-time WBC title holder solidified himself as a top contender with a jaw-dropping third-round win over David Lemieux. With the win, Benavidez successfully wrapped the interim WBC title around his waist. In a perfect world, the Phoenix, Arizona native would be lined up to take on the likes of Jermall Charlo, Caleb Plant, David Morrell, or undisputed super middleweight champion Canelo Alvarez. In any event, come November 5th, Benavidez fully plans on being glued to his television screen. Well, you ain't got much of a choice. When you're a PBC fighter, they don't keep you but so active. Oh yeah, they'll leave you with plenty of time to watch TV. Plenty of time to watch other fighters fight. In terms of how he sees Ramirez versus Bivol playing out, Benavidez appears to be picking with his heart as opposed to his head. It's a really tricky fight. It's going to be hard for Zerto Ramirez, but to be honest, I'm rooting for Zerto. He's my boy. I love him to death. Cognitive dissonance. We talk about it all the time here on the channel. Fan bases whose beliefs are not consistent, consistent with reality. Because his reality, there are fights they could make for this kid on his own side of the street. They don't make them. And what does he do, him and his team? They stay on that side of the street. Nothing changes. Nothing gets done. You say the guys on your side of the street, they don't want to fight you. They don't want nothing to do with you. You say that you just can't seem to land a Canelo Alvarez fight. That's not happening for you either. Well, what the hell are you still doing at 168 pounds then? What the hell are you doing? What the hell are you still doing on that side of the street? What are you doing? Hey, hey, for argument's sake, just for argument's sake, let's just say all of that is true. Let's say you can't get a fight with the guys at 168 pounds. You can't pin down Canelo Alvarez. None of this is happening for you. It's not happening for you at 168. It's not happening for you on the PBC side of things. Well, what the hell are you still doing over there then? You've been chasing around Jermall Charlo for two years now. This is the part of the conversation where I normally talk about how David's current predicament is a self-inflicted wound that through his own negligence, he painted himself into a corner. This is the part where I normally do that, but I'm not even gonna do that because if it's your goal 
to turn over a new leaf and start fighting in the kind of fights that you haven't been fighting in. The big fights, the intriguing fights, the interesting fights. Never mind the past, we're here in the present. What the hell are you doing about it? What's your manager doing about it? What's your promoter doing about it? What are they doing? Why are we hypothesizing about fictitious scenarios where the winner of Bivol versus Ramirez out of the clear blue sky just affords you a title shot. Why aren't you going out there and earning one? I know what you're gonna tell me. You're gonna tell me he's got WBC interim title at super middleweight. But to that I'll ask you a question. Do you think the WBC is gonna strip Canelo Alvarez, the cash cow of boxing in this country, you think they're gonna strip him of his green belt to give it to David. They haven't done it yet. How long do you think it'll take them to get around to doing that if they ever do it? Because they get bigger sanctioning fees from a Canelo fight than a David Benavidez fight by far and wide. It's not even close. So what are you going to do? You're going to trust them to strip Canelo Alvarez for not fighting David Benavidez? Is that your logic? Well, I mean, good luck with that. But what the hell is David Benavidez going to do in the mean in between time? I know what he's going to do. He's going to name drop other fighters, talk about their fight and watch them fight while his career dies on the vine. vine. You know vine. that underneath vine. it all, maybe David Benavidez really does want those kinds of fights. Fights with the likes of Dimitri Bivol and Zerto Ramirez. Maybe he, as a fighter, has that fire in his belly that he still wants to see himself opposite the ring, someone like that. But his team's actions, or the lack thereof, they tell a different story. They say the opposite. If these were the kind of fights that you really wanted as a fighter, that's what your management and that's what your promoter would be working towards. There are a lot of people happy to make excuses for this kid's paper-thin resume, but I'm not one of them. You got these people, they're all hanging around, talking you up. These people you keep around you, what the hell are they getting paid to do? Mm -hmm. If your career isn't where you want it to be, what the hell is your manager doing? What the hell is your promoter doing? If you ain't been able to get none of the fights that you wanted at 168 pounds, what the hell are you still doing there? Well, you say that the PBC ain't got the run of the place at light heavyweight. Perhaps that's why you stayed. Well, maybe you should leave. Can he leave? If he can't, then that renders this entire conversation useless. An exercise in futility. Not when underneath it all we know he's not going to fight either of them. No. Nope. He's not going to go anywhere. No. Nope. He's not going to do anything. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. Then what the hell are we still talking about this far? They keep on saying this fight's going to happen. And once again, this fight may happen, but further down the future, they said the fight was going to happen, what, in November? Mm hmm. Yep. November 19th, I, I, I think. November 19th. So that's basically all, all we, we'll say. But um, but um, a month away, okay, mm -hmm. a little bit over a month away, okay, six weeks, whatever, mm -hmm. right? No press tour, no. Nope. Uh, uh, no press conference at all, no. Nope. Spence didn't post about it, no. Nope. Crawford didn't post about right. it. At the end of the day, as of right now, as of right now, the Spence and Crawford fight is not happening. Damn. Floyd Mayweather's recent commentary on this fight doesn't necessarily mean that Errol Spence Jr. was lying when he said that Crawford is next. The Terrence Crawford fight may very well be Errol's next fight. The disconnect is thinking that that fight is right around the corner. It seems like this fight, if it does happen, it won't happen until sometime next year. From the sound of it, at least based on what Floyd was saying, sounds like they're not looking to do this thing until several months into next year. Several? Could very well be. I heard something about the beginning of next year, February, at or around that time. Though with these guys, you never really know because they don't know how to meet the consumer's demands. They don't know how to. That's just reality. They think they know what they're doing over there, but they don't. They're always patting themselves on the back for the success that they used to have in the previous era of boxing, which doesn't speak to what's going on here today. Terrence Crawford here today is in his mid-30s. Errol's in his early 30s. For perspective, do you want to know how old Sugar Ray Leonard was the first time he fought Roberto Duran? He was 24 years old. Roberto was 29. Let me tell you a story. Sugar. Sugar Ray Leonard. One of the greats. Right. He was 23 years old when he fought Wilfredo Benitez, 24 years old when he fought Roberto Duran, and 25 years old when he fought Tommy Hearns. Both Oscar De La Hoya and Felix Trinidad were a very, very spry 26, 26 years, years old when they fought each other. Oscar, 26 years old when he fought Felix Trinidad, 27 years old when he fought Shane Mosley. 29 years old when he fought Fernando Vargas. Pisto, pisto. They're on the brink of getting prostate exams they haven't fought each other yet. Al Heyman doesn't know what the 
fuck he's doing? In the name of Floyd fucking Mayweather. Floyd fucking Mayweather. Get a for this guy. He almost sounds condescending when he says it, that the fight's not going to happen yet. You really ought to be a little bit more understanding, a little bit more considerate, more sincere to the consumer base. He and Al Heyman both hope purchase this fight. The consumer base that seems to be dwindling and running out of patience. Floyd Mayweather, the dancing bear. That's what he is these days. I don't care what he used to do at the box office. I don't care what he used to sell on pay-per-view because these days... I don't care what he was doing. What is he doing? You know what he's doing? He's a dancing bear. What he's doing is he's staging exhibition matches that don't seem to be getting picked up by major broadcasters here in the United States because, put simply, there's no demand for them. Major networks, major broadcasters like Fox, like Showtime, they don't want those fights. Floyd's relying on the celebrity of local draws, local talent to help sell tickets behind the guise of it being his own celebrity that puts asses in the seats. If he had any real celebrity left, they'd be paying for the rights to these exhibition fights here in the United States, but they're not. They're ending up on Fight TV with the rest of the stuff. The rest of the stuff that really doesn't have an audience here in America. The bottom line here is Floyd and Al, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Spent all that time downplaying Terrence Crawford as a fighter, downplaying his accomplishments over there at the PBC and their affiliated networks, describing Errol Spence Jr. as a box office draw. But what kind of box office draw is he when you've got to wait this long to make the numbers work? If he really were a draw, he'd be able to finance this fight. And all its operational costs... He'd be able to do that off his own drawing power if he really were that big a draw, but he's not. He's not that much more of a draw than Terrence is, and that's what I've been telling you for four years. There's no Bob Arum in the picture. It's all up to Al Heyman and his network affiliates to get this fight over the line now. Al Heyman, who fast developed a reputation as some kind of guru, some kind of magician that can make all things possible, all things happen based on the success that he had with Floyd. But by the time he got Floyd, Floyd was a complete fighter already, a finished product. It wasn't Al that made Floyd the generational talent that he went on to be. He just got lucky. He is in the right place at the right time. If he really were some kind of boxing swami, he would have had another one by now. Another what? Another Floyd. If all of Floyd's success were attributed to something that Al Heyman did, then surely Al Heyman would be able to do it again. That's if all of Floyd's success were really due to Al Heyman. It's not. It never was. He stumbled onto a generational talent that made things easier. It's up to Al Heyman to deliver this fight, you understand. There's nobody else in the picture. It's just Al and his network affiliates. And that people still feel the need to apologize for his incompetence is mind-boggling. He really thought that guy was some kind of fucking boxing swami. He's a music guy masquerading as a boxing guy. That's it.